Thank you for tuning in to a sermon from Redemption Hill Church. I'm so glad that you've joined us. It's our prayer that this will lift your heart and encourage you, set your eyes more fully on Jesus as we open God's word together. You can join us anytime in person or online in our live stream. You can find that at redemptionhilldc.org. If you're not in D.C., we encourage you to get involved in a local church where you live for the sake of encouragement and accountability in a local body, but we're also glad to have you join us and, and walk through this study with us. If you'd like to support the Ministries of Redemption Hill, you can do so at our website, again, redemptionhilldc.org. Father, we are thankful to be together. We are thankful for the chance to lift our voices together, to hear others sing your praise, to be able to pray together and now to be able to open your word. And so we pray that you would move in our hearts. We pray that today you would help us not to come in with an assumption that we have everything figured out, but instead to come with our deepest needs, knowing that the only hope we have is in Christ. And I pray that you would give us an openness in heart and that you would open our ears to hear your voice. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in a five-week series on virtues out of Ephesians chapter 4, and this is the fifth week of it. And so um, if you're joining us for the first time, you, you are catching the tail end of this series. And um, by the way, for everyone, next week we are beginning a new series, and the next series we are going to do is a study in the life of Abraham, beginning in Genesis 12 and through the center section of Genesis. And so I'm very excited about that and more to come this upcoming week. Um, but today we come to a close in this series, and, and so we've been in Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to begin today just by reading Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Now, as a reminder, the first three chapters of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul builds the beauty and glory of the good news of what Jesus has done for us, that he has taken a fractured humanity and reconciled us to God and to each other. He's taken a broken humanity and brought healing and unity, and so now he turns in the last half of the book of this letter to turn toward what does it look like to live as a citizen in Christ's kingdom. And he says, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and pa with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so in this, the apostle is saying this is the beginning point, kind of the summary statement about what's to follow in these chapters, and he reminds the Ephesians he's writing from prison, and so he is coming from a humiliated position as he writes this letter, but he reminds them, and he says, okay, now, in light of this glorious calling we have in Christ, we have been given the unity of the Spirit, we have been given the bond of peace because Christ himself is our peace. In chapter 2, he says, we are dead, alone in our transgressions and sins, but God has made us alive together with Christ. And so from that, the first step he calls us to in walking out that calling, if you are a follower of Jesus, and what it looks like to have an eagerness to maintain what we've been already been given in Christ, in unity, in, in, the, in the spirit and the bond of peace, he says, this is, this is some of what it looks like, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance and love. As we've walked through the series, we've seen that, that humility or lowliness is not self-deprecation. It's, it's, it's not thinking, as is, is often been said, not thinking less of yourself, but thinking about yourself less. It's an internal quality of having a right perspective on who you are before God and who others are before God. And when humility works itself out in relationship between us and other people, it looks like gentleness. Now, the word there is meekness is another way this is translated. And so when we are humble in relationship, it shows up because we have power, but it's under control. So we don't minimize who we are or the ways that God has gifted us, but we have it under control because we're coming to others with a spirit of gentleness to make sure that people know that we're there for help and healing, not for attack. He calls us to patience, which is literally, the language is long-suffering to be able to endure through whatever circumstances we walk through, and that, when it's applied relationally, looks like forbearance. So we bear with each other. We, we, uh, we forgive each other. And remember when Peter asks Jesus, well, how many times are we supposed to give? Up to seven? He says, no, 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 no. Seventy-seven times. And so we, the forbearance is patience worked out relationally, 
and today we come to love. This is probably the most accepted attribute of God in our whole world right now, that if we, if, we want, if we ask somebody, what do we want to think about God, the first thing that would come to mind is we want God to be loving, that God is love. Now, the way we shape that in our minds might not follow God's self-disclosure, but our imagination of what is most loving is we think about an idealized version of ourselves or an idealized version of a human being, but God is love. And so we're going to take time today to try to understand, like we have with these other virtues, what is love, what isn't love, what is the biblical foundation for how we're to understand what love is. And of the five virtues, this is probably the one that has been the hardest for me to cut material and edit down so that we could possibly get out of here before Ebenezer's service starts this morning. And you're good, it's a good thing for you all that, that we have that stop point. <laughs> And so I started by going where I thought would be most interesting in this. Um, and this, I know these are going back a little ways, but I thought, why don't we look toward music? I mean, you think about love, you think about poetry, and think about you know, singing songs or writing poems and odes to somebody. And so I looked to music about what, what do we, how do we think about love? Well, several decades ago, the Beatles t told us with great clarity that all you need is love. Not every musician is as convinced. Hathaway said, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. Tina Turner was even more skeptical, saying, what's love got to do with it? Like, what's love but a secondhand emotion? What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? And Burt Bacharach counters Tina Turner, saying, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. So there's not much help <laughs> from the music industry. What is love not? Let's start there. Again, sometimes antonyms are the, the most helpful. Well, the obvious one is love is not hate. That, that's again, the one that might come first to mind. You don't hate somebody you love. But, but even more than that, it, you know, it might say, it's often been noticed or observed that, that love and hate might not be as far apart as love and apathy. Because there's at least a strong emotion attached, and the only way that the hatred or real anger can be stirred up is if we're passionate about something. And so hatred might indicate something that we do, in fact, love, but apathy and indifference, a removal from, is, is the opposite of love, for sure. It, love is not passive. Love is not undiscerning. It's also not without accountability or teeth or some kind of boundaries. In every relationship we have that we enter into, what it means to love each other, there have to be terms of agreement on what the relationship looks like and what is most loving to each other. So it's not withdrawal, it's not apathy, it's also not niceness. I have so little patience for, the Bible does not call us to niceness. We're called to kindness, but niceness has a sense, almost a connotation of you're not being totally honest, that you're putting up a front in order to be nice. Um, some of us come from cultural backgrounds and settings where that is the cultural background and setting, that everyone is nice. Some of us come from cultural backgrounds and settings where that is not the case. And so like for me, the first, when I lived, I grew up in Chicago, I lived in Indianapolis doing ministry for about four years, and it took me about three of those years to figure out that they were not blessing my heart. And so kindness is different. Love is not niceness. It doesn't just gloss over, it is, it, but it is kind. So love is not self-focused, self-pursuing, or self-fulfilling. That's something that we have a really hard time with because the way we use love often is self-focused, self-pursuing, and self-fulfilling. So what is love? Now, theologian John Stott says that it is the preceding four, it embraces all four, and so it, brings, it binds them together in unity. And so love is not separate from humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, but it binds those things together. It's the, it's the, the thing that keeps things held together, and, and it is to constructively seek the welfare of others and the good of community. And so love, in its essence, takes self-sacrifice for the flourishing of other people. Now, is that true? Is that how we use it? I don't know. I'm not convinced, and that's part of what we're going to look at 
as we walk forward today. I mean, when we use the word love, we throw it around for all kinds of things. Last, yesterday, I did a wedding, and so love was talked about a lot at a wedding, as it ought to be and usually is. But even at the wedding or at the rehearsal dinner, they took us to a steakhouse, and I was sitting with the parents of the bride and groom, and I love steak. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was actually served medium rare, which does not happen in big meals very often. It was wonderful. Is that the same as what the love we celebrated on Saturday? Maybe. Like, I love nachos. I, I, I got to get off food. <laughs> I love the food. I love football. The Bears had a preseason game yesterday, and it was glorious just to have NFL football. I love my kids. I love my wife. So how, how can we use one word for that kind of range? Well, as we start talking about love, we'll look first at the truth of what I've already said. And if we're going to understand love in a biblical sense, if we believe that there is an almighty creator of all things who has disclosed himself ultimately in his word given to us, then let's turn to what God's word says. And that begins, this one begins, in the essence, in the nature of God, because God is love. Now, this one, that's interesting, because we don't read God is patience, God is forbearance, but God is love. In 1 John 4, John, the apostle, writes, writes this to, to this church that he, and he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been, both, has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was man made manifest among us. That means it showed up among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that, he, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, and if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So John says, God is love. How do we know that God is love? Well, because we know because we look at Jesus, and Jesus is God incarnate. Remember the first chapter of John's gospel that he wrote when he said, like, okay, the other gospel writers go back to Jesus's, you know, Mark starts with the baptism of Jesus, Matthew and Luke go back to the birth of Jesus and his genealogy, and Luke goes back to, like, Zechariah and John the Baptist before that, and John's like, that's not far enough. So in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and the Word took on flesh and dwelt among us, and He, in Him, we have seen the one and only, full of grace and truth. And so God is love. That means that our foundation for understanding love needs to come from an understanding of who God is. And, and the hope we have is that, that the foundation for our ability to love actually comes and springs out of us because we bear the image and likeness of God. Now, God is triune, and this is, this is one of the beautiful things about the essence of love being core to the essence of God, is that God is three in one, three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, one God together with one will of God, which means that God has eternally existed in a loving unity of these three persons. Love is not created because God created us as an object to love. Creation is an explosive overflow of intra-Trinitarian love that God already had from eternity past. And every human being bears the image and likeness of God. So the, the, the love we show reflects God's love coming through us. And it's ultimately, as John says, it's shown in Christ coming and making a propitiation for us. The meaning that Christ's death brought God's wrath off of us as he took it on. And that's how ultimately how we see love. Now we're talking about when we get into this, this, this understanding of these realms theologically, it gets, it gets intense, it gets hard to understand. And God's love is difficult to understand. I think it's among the most difficult doctrines for us to dig into. I know that might sound confusing, right? Because if you think about difficult doctrines, what would you jump to? You might say like, well, like eschatology. Well, if you were here for a Revelation series, you'll see it's not that difficult. 
You might think, you know, we jump into different areas or the, you know, the union of in Christ, of fully God, fully man. I think God's love is among the most difficult doctrines to be able to understand. Um, Don Carson wrote a little tiny book called The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. If you really want to dig into an understanding of God's love and what it means for God to love the whole world, God to love his children, God to love the Son, how God's love is used in Scripture, how it intersects with God's sovereignty and wrath, this it is the best resource I can recommend to you. It's Don Carson, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. It's written accessibly. Um, I don't know that I've handed out many books more often than that one. He lists five reasons that it's, un it's difficult to understand God's love. And so briefly, he says that the biblical definition, theological definition of love isn't close to the same as our prevailing understanding of love. The entire framework of scripture stands outside of and in contrast to the framework of the beliefs around us. And so that makes it hard because the biblical framework is so opposed to the one that we, swim, that we like breathe and swim in in our lives every day that we need a complete rewiring to understand God's love. The second reason he gives that it's difficult <clears throat> is that we live in a world in which many other complementary truths about God are widely disbelieved. And so the love of God has been purged of anything that people find uncomfortable. Again, nobody wants to deny that God is love. Anybody that recognizes that there is a higher power wants to say that the first attribute is loving. But God's love cannot be understood apart from God's holiness. God's love can't be understood apart from his sovereignty, his wrath, his providence, and his personhood. People don't struggle to believe that God is loving, but they do struggle with his justice and his omniscience and his wrath. It's true in churches, too, and, and true that too many Christians sentimentalize God's love, and so we picture him as some giant grandfather in the sky with a pipe next to a warm fire. And we don't, and, and it, there's only welcome and warmth. We don't understand the holiness and majesty and transcendence of God. And you can't understand his love removed from that. The third reason is we have had epistemological shifts in the West that point us to that the only real heresy is belief that there is heresy at all. That's a big way of saying that we now don't know how we know anything. And the fact to claim anything and claim that something else is wrong is now the only thing that is truly wrong. And so we try to fit God into our sensibilities and understanding rather than letting God and his word set the terms. And so we end up creating God into our image and likeness and reinterpreting scripture or just cutting out sections we don't like so that he can be more palatable rather than saying, if God is the creator of all things and disclosed who he is, then we better pay attention to what he says. And if, we're, if, it, if, it's a, if, if it contradicts what we like, then the problem is not with God's word, it's with our hearts that need to come more fully into the image and likeness of Christ. The fourth reason, remember there's only five here, so the fourth reason that it's difficult to understand God's love is our reduction of God to love only makes it impossible to answer life's hardest questions. If God is only love and is not sovereign, if God is only love and doesn't have justice or wrath, then what do we do with the world around us? How do we understand the suffering that happened in two world wars? You have no answer. If God is only love and no justice and wrath and there's no, no conclusion to this world and humanity, then, then how do you understand genocide in Russia, in China, in Germany, in Africa? How do we make sense of ISIS and the evils that are persisting in Syria? What's happened in Ukraine? How do we make sense of Hitler and Pol Pot? None of that is simple. And a reductionistic view of God doesn't help us to be able to interpret and understand the world around us, and suffering in particular. All right, and finally, the fifth reason God's, the doctrine of God's love is hard is because as Christians, we tend to oversimplify doctrines, especially the doctrines of love, leaving us to think that it's more obvious or easier than it really is. And so part of what makes it difficult is we go, yeah, God is love. Check. 
And so we don't spend the time and invest the time really digging into it and, and understanding that God loves all kinds of different ways just like us, that there's, there's love within the Trinity between Father and Son and Spirit and there's providential care over all of creation and, and he also loves the world and cares about people's salvation, particularly for his, for his people, his chosen elect. And, and sometime, but sometimes God's love is conditional based on obedience and we see that throughout scripture. And so how do we understand all of that? That's what we're going to try to wrap up in the next 20-ish minutes. I want to look linguistically first. There's uh, several Hebrew words that are translated love. The most common is ahav, which is love between people. It's also used of God in his love for people. But the word for love in the, in the Old Testament in Hebrew that is the most, uh, the one that is mo most uniquely used of God is the word chesed. Hesed love is unique, and it is, um, this is, I think the best definition of this Hebrew word comes from the Jesus Storybook Bible. Um, we hand that out to every child we dedicate at Redemption Hill, and I say every time, if you have not read this book, it is one of the best theology books money can buy, and I think every time that gets a giggle, and I mean it. It's because Sally Lloyd-Jones in that children's Bible defines it this way in, in one of the chapters, that in, in the big lie, when it's, she's talking about the fall, of humanity. In that chapter, she says, you see, no matter what, in spite of everything, God would love his children with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And though they would forget him and run from him, deep in their hearts, God's children would miss him always and long for him, lost children yearning for their home. And so what is chesed love? It is God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. It's God's covenantal love. Different translations, you'll see it translated differently, and you'll begin, hopefully the translations, most of them are consistent. So sometimes, especially in Psalms, you'll read about God's steadfast love never ceases. That's trans, trying to translate this word and trying to capture that essence of God's never stopping, never giving up, always and forever love. It might be loving kindness, and so this is the way that God loves. It, it, Paul Miller, in his book, A Loving Life, describes it as love without an exit plan. He said, why chesed love is so important? Because life is moody, feelings come and go, pressures rise and fall, passions ebb and flow, but chesed is at the, in the, a stake in the heart of the changing seasons of life. Words of commitment create a, that create a bond that stands against life's moodiness. And so that's some of the Hebrew sense of God's love. Now when we get to the New Testament era, <clears throat> our Bibles were written in Greek, there's a lot of, of distinctions that people make between the two primary words that are used in our New Testaments are agape or agapao and phileo or philos. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves, breaks down the four senses of love in classical Greek, which is not the same quite as New Testament Greek. New Testament Greek is called koine Greek, meaning it was common or defiled. It was the Greek that Alexander the Great spread so that he could Hellenize the world. And so it was a simplified version of the Teton dialect so that everybody could communicate with each other. So essentially a trade language, somewhat of what English feels like now in many parts of the world. And so when, the, when, it, when we're told in scripture that, that it, when the fullness of time had come, that Christ came into the world, Christ came into a world where the, the Western world, the Mediterranean world, was all able to speak a, a common language. Now in classical Greek, <clears throat> that Lewis breaks down, there are four different uses of, that are translated love. Storge is charity. <clears throat> Philos is brotherly love, agape is self-sacrificial love, and eros is sexual love. Lewis is, makes an important point that eros is the cheapest of the loves and the one that you don't have to sacrifice anything for anyone else, but the deepest of it may be philos, or brotherly love, friendship. In the New Testament, though, agape and philos are, or philia are essentially interchangeable. They aren't uniquely used of God, and so there's lots of places where agape is used where it's not to indicate God's love. Um, and, and so really the Greek terms are more like how we speak in English. I love nachos. I love stained glass. I love my kids. I love this church. I love my wife. I love the Cubs. Like that is, and so it's used in varying ways. 
And so biblical context is important. That love is, God's love is self-sacrificial for others' good and flourishing. And so that's a sense of what it means that God is love. And there's two basic commands to us. And so the second observation about love is that we are commanded to love God supremely. Jesus in the Gospels is asked in, in different times by different people, what is the greatest of, com- of the commandments? Now there were 613 commands in the Torah that the religious leaders had broken things down to. They cited 613. So coming to Jesus and saying, what is the greatest of these commandments was not just talking about the 10 that you might be familiar with. And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and, f- great and first commandment. And before they could speak up, he said, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments depend, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so Jesus makes it clear <clears throat> that this is the foundation of everything. What does God call us to? When we look at all of the law and all of the prophets, the entire scripture that Jesus and his followers had, because remember, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. What, what are the, what's the most important things we draw out of that? And he distills everything down to these two. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Now on that first one, it's a call to love God with everything we are, supremely in our lives. This is a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6. So Jesus goes back to the law as he cites this, and it is an important statement in Deuteronomy. As it, as it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I, that I command you today shall be on your heart. And then it goes on to teach what God's word means in the households, that it should be in, in every aspect of our lives, that we should teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise and bind them as a sign on your hands and this frontlets between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates saying be immersed in God's word as a reminder of the call we have to hear that God is one and we're called to love God with everything we are. And this is called the Shema. It is still a key verse and passage that is cited by Jewish people through today. And it's said, and they, they, they sung through cantillations, but in the Hebrew, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. That it's, it's a call to hear that God is one. And the very first commandment is to love God with everything that we are which none of us has done. Our hearts get fickle. We chase after all kinds of things. And in scripture, the language for that is idolatry, that we get caught up in seeking out other things to fulfill us. But like Sally Lloyd-Jones said, that we might look for things everywhere else and run from him and forget him, but, but deep in our hearts, we will miss him and there will always be a longing within us for something we're missing without God in our lives. This is why the 10 commandments start with the first two. 20% 20% of the Ten Commandments are, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make any idols. And so God is saying, you've got to keep the Lord primary. And then the third one, don't take the name of the Lord God in vain. Don't use it in an empty way. We can't make it through these first three, verse, through the first three commands. We knowingly and actively choose things we know we shouldn't, even against our own convictions, and we know, knowingly and actively choose things that we know we're going to feel bad about within 10 minutes. And so we definitely don't love God supremely at all times, and yet God's love toward us is faithful and steadfast and true. And so the call of Scripture is not something that is beyond understanding or beyond compare. It's calling us to love God the way that God loves us. It's saying, if, you've been, if the image and likeness of God has been imprinted onto you as a human being, then the first calling we have is to love God with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. Too often we fall short. The second one as well. Remember Jesus said the second one is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. In Luke's gospel, as soon as Jesus says that, one of the teachers says, okay, and who is my neighbor? And that is the same question that we're asking today. Do I have to love that guy or that girl? Do I have to love this group of people? The answer Jesus has is yes. This comes from Leviticus chapter 19, where it says, 
You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Just a little bit later in Ephesians 5, in the, in the next chapter from the passage we've been in, Paul says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So again, what we're being called to is to love others as God loves us, to reciprocate that love to God and then express that love to others. Jesus told his disciples this is the way that the world would know them and recognize his people. He says in John chapter 13, when he's at the Last Supper, the last time he would spend with the disciples on that side of the crucifixion and resurrection, and he says to them, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That means that Jesus is saying that our love for each other, if you call yourself a follower of Christ and are a disciple of Jesus Christ, then the love that we have for God's people is going to have evangelistic impact or consequence. That if we are not loving each other, we are not reflecting the beauty of what Christ has done for us and our evangelistic witness will be tarnished. Not Christ, but us. But by loving one another, we reflect the beauty of what the gospel accomplishes. And so what Ephesians 4 is calling us to, to bring it all back around, is sacrificial care for the flourishing of others. It's saying the call of Jesus to everyone that comes after him is take up your cross daily and follow me. And so it shouldn't surprise us that when it, what it looks like to walk in light of that calling takes self-sacrifice. But it isn't the way that we think about love. It's not the advice you'll get in our world. Now, again, I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm a big fan of therapy. I highly recommend therapy and counseling. But the overuse of therapeutic language in our world and concept without context can be damaging. And so the, in our world right now, the, to love someone, you'll be told that, I mean, the idea of forbearance goes out the window. The idea that you would forgive somebody and stick in a relationship where somebody has wronged you is, isn't a possibility. And so often the way that our understanding of love has been shaped has been shaped by the world that we live in. I mean, unavoidably, every one of us. That, and so when we say that we love someone, we, I don't think what we're often saying is, I want to spend my life living self-sacrificially with a never stopping, never giving up, always and forever love so that this person will flourish. I think often what we're saying is, when we say, ah, oh, I love that person, we're saying, I love how I feel when I'm with that person. I think that happens in friendship. We like to be around people that make us feel good. That's not wrong, but let's call it what it is. It's happened in, in romantic relationships. I have never met with a couple in premarital counseling and had them say, oh, I just you know, had the guy, I just really love her. What do you mean by that? Help me understand. And I have, I have couples write a definition of love. And see, now I'm giving the answer sheet away. So if one of you comes and goes through our Moving Toward Marriage class and you write this, I'll know where you got it. But I've never had somebody write that the reason they want to get married is so that they can spend their lifetime laying themselves down so that this one individual can flourish before God and in their lives in this world. Usually what it means is I get nice warm butterflies and I'd like to be with this person. And I think we can give this a go. And so it's not wrong to have good feelings toward people, but love can't just be feeling. I've had this when I work with couples who come out to, the, to a point where they've just been struggling and grinding through and they feel like they're at the end of their limit and you hear things like, I've just fallen out of love with them. What does that mean? It means you don't feel the same way as you did when you were younger. Well, no kidding. I've been married for 22 years now and I love my wife and it does not feel like when we were 19 when we got engaged. We were babies when we got engaged, but it doesn't feel the same, and it shouldn't. We have 22 years of marriage 
that we've walked through together, the highs and the lows. And so love can't just be contained to a warm and fuzzy moment. There's got to be something more solid, more real that's there. I, we both need to be in it fully to, in, to commit to the, good, to the other's good, whatever it takes. And so th- the love that we think of, when, or the way we use love, is too often, if we're, if we're honest, it's transactional and consumeristic. Like, I love you because this is good for me, but if it's not good for me anymore, I'm going to have to evaluate return on investment. Like, am I, am I putting in more, too much to get the return I'm getting? Like, that is not biblical love. And too often, that's our approach in churches. That our approach in community is usually more based on our preferences than and our, contingent is, our, our commitment is contingent on, on things going our way. And as soon as we feel spiritually dry or lonely or frustrated, we can bounce. Now, I'm not saying that you should just stick in a church and be miserable. There are definitely times and seasons for different things in life. And I'm not saying you're bound to a local church in that kind of way. And at times it'll be better for people to move on than to fester. But, but what I, I am asking you to evaluate, if you're a part of Redemption Hill, then what is your posture toward other people? What's your posture toward other people in your life, in your relationships, your roommates, your spouse, your, your other people, in people in your community group or people in the church? Are you centered on self-fulfillment or are you focused on investing yourself for something bigger? Are you eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace? See, there's a difference between true and false unity and true and false relationships. And in the church, there is a such thing as false unity. Not all unity is good. There are plenty of people that are unified around terrible, terrible causes. And so we can't just say like, we need to go for unity. Well, unity about what? Unity about Jesus and his kingdom. That's what we're about. But if we have unity, even good unity about Christ's kingdom and mission, and we're coming together for the right reasons, but we don't have love, then it's empty. It's a fake. If we have the the bond of peace that is talked about here, and we don't have love, then it's not peace. It's withdrawal and keeping a distance so that we don't have friction. But if we have love and unity and peace, then that is when God's power can move through his people. The body of Christ is built up. We'll spend less time on sideways energy and more time focused on the mission that God has called us to. And in our relationships, we don't think of love as being self-sacrificial deeply enough. And so... We, again, we think in, in, in romantic relationships, and I know that not every relationship is romantic, but, but in romantic relationships, we, again, it's, we, it's, it's, it's like warm butterflies that we characterize as love. When, when Alyssa and I were getting engaged, we, we used to say to each other with all affection, you make me queasy. You know, you just feel something inside. The wedding yesterday, I reminded those present that, that the idea of compromise in marriage is not a great way to go into marriage. Because if you go in and you get the advice that, that you know, every, marriage is all about compromise, that if you go with that mentality, each person will always be fighting for their 51%. You know, it takes a whole self-commitment. Especially, I mean, men, in Ephesians chapter 5 later on, This is what it, if you are going to pursue a woman and get married, then what you're called to is it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's the calling of a Christian marriage. Men, that you go into marriage with a lifelong commitment to lay yourself down for one woman to see her flourish. Now, marriage isn't some higher calling or some, great, some greater step into maturity. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 that he wishes all of us were single like he was so we didn't have the distractions of marriage and we could be fully invested in Christ's kingdom. But for those of you who are married, remember that your vows are for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do you part. 
And so we need to understand what love is in the context of who God is. And ultimately, Jesus is love incarnate. In Romans 5, chapter, eight, or chapter 5, verse 8, we're told that the love of God has been shown for us. How do we know that God loves us? He showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We don't have to clean up to come to God. We don't need to figure things out. We don't need to love God supremely and others sacrificially in order to be acceptable to God. He made a way through Christ. And so we are welcomed into the intra-Trinitarian love of God that came to its fullness in the, in the fullness of time as his plan of redemption conceived in the mind of God exploded into history, as one theologian says, that, that when the time had come, God sent his son, and we have been privileged not only to be saved by God's love, to be shown it and informed about it, and, and because of God's love, we have hope in life now and for the future. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's a passage on love that is often used at weddings, but it's actually a passage to the church. It's in the context of spiritual gifts, and the church in Corinth was arguing and arrogant about the kind of giftedness that different people had. And, and Paul says to them, listen, nobody has all the gifts. It's one body, there's many parts, and it's the same spirit that gives gifts to everyone. And so this is the most excellent way. Yeah, there are good gifts, but this is the most excellent way. The only gift, the normative gift that anybody, if you're a follower of Jesus, that you have been given is in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So if he has that gift but it's not paired with love, it's just noise. If I have prophetic powers to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And love never ends. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And every other giftedness we have or pursue is going to fade. But God is love. The thing that I love about reading 1 Corinthians 13 and the the way that love is described is that we see every single one of these characteristics fulfilled in Christ. Fifteen different characteristics of love. And so the hope we have to understand what love is is that Jesus endured suffering that allows us to be patient with others. That Jesus' tenderness moves us to kindness to others. Jesus' sacrifice frees us from envy for personal gain or being jealous of what others have, have gained. Jesus' submission to God eliminates any ground we have for boasting. Jesus' humility has saved us, and we know that in the gospel we are hopeless on our own for our salvation, and so we can't be arrogant. Jesus' holiness removes our desire for shameful behavior as we come into the presence of his light. He sought our good so that we will not have the, we have no right to be, um, so that we, I'm sorry, he sought our good so that we will seek the good of others, and Jesus exposes our sin. He shows us what still needs to be brought out to the light so that it doesn't destroy us from within, and so knowing that we are sinners, we have no right to be irritable with other people. Jesus died for other sin, and so we can't continue to count it against them and be resentful. He fills us with his spirit so that we won't celebrate sin, but he's also the author of all truth. And so through Christ, we can know truth and be known. Praise God that we can rejoice in truth. 
Jesus bore the cross so that we can bear with all things. He, his faithfulness strengthens us to believe all things. His resurrection provides, hope, provides the hope for all things. And Jesus' power at work within us, by his spirit, equips us to endure all things. And so the hope we have to love the way that God loves is only through Christ. He's made a way for us. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, or if you think you've been, been a Christian, but you know that you've been playing a game and you can't figure out if this is something that's real in your life, you need to hear today, this is the way that God loves. We don't have to wonder if God is a God of love, but we need to let God set the terms, and the terms that God sets are so much better than the flimsy things that we look at. God is the, the majestic, holy, all-powerful creator of all things who has not destroyed us, but instead has pursued us in Christ with a never-stopping, never-giving-up, unending, always-and-forever love. And coming to Jesus, we are promised that his spirit will transform us day to day from one degree of glory to the next, and we will be able to love more like Christ. And so what is love? God is love. And he's shown us what it looks like to love through the incarnation, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, is all love all we need? Well, it depends. Were the Beatles right? The love of people is fickle. You hear one day, gone the next, you can't control that, no matter how close they are to you. The love of ourselves is fleeting. Some of you know that. Some of you are real good at loving yourselves. Others of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about because uh, I, it is crushingly absent for me. <laughs> but it's, it's fleeting. But if we're gonna talk about the love of God that's been shown in Christ and ask the question, is it true that all you need is love, then yes. That's the hope we have, that the need we have within us can be fulfilled, that, that we can be fully known and fully loved by God. There is nothing more important than to love God with everything we are and to love others uh, self-sacrificially. Every aspect of our lives, if you come to Christ, will be defined by the presence or absence of love. Why? Because God first loved us and it was proved when Christ died for us. And so to love is to live in light of the calling and walk in light of the calling we have received. So love is a difficult doctrine. But if we can begin to grasp it, and we can understand the essential part it plays in the nature of God and what he has shown us, then it gives us hope that we can be conduits of God's grace and love to each other. And so with that, we close our series, and I'll read again. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Father, we pray that you would show us, give us a sense today of your love for us. That it's not just an emotion or a feeling or a sensation, but, but there's a, a deep rootedness in reality and truth of what you've shown us in Christ. But even with that, Lord, there are people that are sitting here right now who really are having a hard time. They feel forgotten about. They feel like they're in the dark. They feel like they're alone. And cry out like David in the Psalms, how long, Lord, will you, will you forget me forever? How long are you going to hide your face from me? So, Father, for those that are wrestling in that place, here right now, I pray that your spirit would break through with a sense of light and warmth and your love for them. We know it's true because of what you've done for us in Christ, and so would you break through to help them to feel your presence. Help us all to not, not be, be based only in our fickle hearts, though, but to trust who you are and what you've done. And we pray that you would shape us 
each one of us as individuals in our church as people, would you shape us in love? Would you shape us in the light of the virtues that we've seen, that love would be the foundation or the joining point that holds it all together so that we could be humble and gentle and patient and, show, and bear with one another. So Father, we thank you for the, the reminder of your word, of your care for us and your love for us. We thank you that you are love. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.